Are you concerned about all this corruption being misgendered as conspiracies? Well, don't you worry. Sit back, relax, and join in the conversation as we talk with today's guest. Welcome to another LSB Film Productions podcast with your host, Chris Brooks. Hello and welcome to the channel. It's me, Chris Brooks, and welcome to another LSB Film Podcast. Today I'm joined by John Hamer, and John Hamer is a author who has written who has written many a book, but his most successful books, I should say, are the falsification of history and the falsification of science. And today we are going to discuss various topics contained within these books. So without further ado, welcome to the show, John. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. So let's talk a little bit then about the evolution and the greatest deception. Right. Um Okay, well, where do you want me to start? It's a big topic, obviously. Um, um, let's just go from the beginning, really. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, well, I mean, it's quite easy to prove in very, very simple terms that evolution is just fake, basically. Um, obviously, everyone knows that it was Charles Darwin that formulated the theory, although that is actually not quite true. It was, it was actually his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, who first mooted the idea um, at the very beginning of the 19th century, maybe the end of the 18th century. And of course, both Erasmus and Charles, and indeed all the Darwin family, were all Freemasons. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. In fact, the entirety of this hoax, for that's exactly what it is, evolution, um, is a, is a joint Freemasonic stroke Jesuit enterprise, uh, which I guess people out there will not be too surprised to hear, mm. given that um, <laughs> you know that they they seem to be involved in just about everything that that's uh, bad about society today and and indeed in the past as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'd I'd like to quote from the Encyclopedia Britannica here. And it says in Britannica that a simple one-celled bacterium, okay, so one single bacteria, one, a one-cell bacterium, contains DNA information units that are the equivalent of 100 million pages of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Right. Okay, right? Yeah. So, and then it gets really... Um, uh, involved here, but bear with me because in the next minute or so, I'm going to prove beyond any shadow of a doubt that evolution is a hoax. Okay, because <laughs> right, first of all, let, let's let's start at the very basics of life. The basic functional unit of a cell is a pro is protein, and proteins comprise hundreds of different amino acids, and to even work, they all every single one of those hundreds, if not thousands, of different amino acids have to be in the right order. Now, following on from that, a simple single cell bacterium alone contains thousands of different proteins, okay? And remember that they all have to be in the right order. Now, the molecular biologist, Francis Crick, who was the, one of the guys along with James Watson, who, uh, uh, who discovered the DNA molecule, allegedly. Okay, well, let's take that as red. But he, he, he calculated the odds of a single protein occurring by chance as being one, get this, in 10 to the power of 260. Okay, which for the non-mathematical non among us, and I include myself in that, <laughs> That is a one followed by 260 zeros, which is an absolutely enormous number. Um, it, it, well, it's, it's more than astronomical. Uh, for comparison purposes, just to let everyone know that that number is greater, get this, than the number of atoms in the known universe. Okay, Not the number of uh, uh, living beings, not the number of uh, planets or suns or star systems, Everything. if they even exist, that's another story altogether, but the number of atoms in the known universe. And mathemat mathematicians classify 
as absolutely impossible anything having odds of greater than 1 in 10 to the power of 50. Now, 1 in 10 to the power of 260 is, as you, to use your term, it's astronomically larger than 1 in the 10 to the power of 50. So it's not just, you know, a small difference. It is a, it is a vast difference. It, in fact, that number is so big that your human brain cannot really conceive it. So what that means in effect, just to, just to summarise that, it means it would have been impossible to get one protein by chance, let alone the thousands of different pro proteins that a simple one-cell bacterium would need to function or even exist. And furthermore, in addition to that, a cell would need the ability to ingest nutrients, to expel waste, and to reproduce. And, you know, <laughs> so hence, hence if a cell ever developed by chance, that very first cell would have had to develop and perfect the process of cellular reproduction in the span of its own single lifetime, because if it didn't, there would never have been a second cell. And Darwin's ridiculous evolutionary process would have ended right there and then. And in a nutshell, that is my proof <laughs> that evolution is a hoax. But there's far more to it than that, obviously. But that's, that's just a glib kind of summary, if and, you like. And is, it, is this all done, I assume, purposely to take people away from the creator? Exactly that. That, that we're just yeah, an accident. Absolutely, Chris. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I mean, it's a very, it's a very complex topic. I do a talk, a stand-up talk called "The Three Pillars of Fake Science," of which evolution is one, and the other two are um, the Big Bang Theory and uh, the Globe Earth. And those those three elements of fake science, and they are all fake science, kind of take away our power if you like we are very powerful spiritual beings but they don't want us to know mm -hmm. that because if they did that would weaken very much weaken their hold over us they need to keep us in a state of ignorance and fear in order for a few thousand people to control eight billion allegedly eight billion i'm sure i believe that but there you go um so yeah that's why it's done you're absolutely right it's it's about making us into tiny little random specks of nothingness that don't mean anything at all. Whereas if all those three pillars are taken away, what's left? We're created, we are powerful spiritual beings, and we have the power to control our own destiny, which obviously they want to take away from us. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, they want to stop us ascending. Indeed. That's, yeah. that's absolutely right. And I, I mean, I can talk a little bit more about that. Some more elements of proof, if you like. Feel free. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to read out a quote which I've just brought up on my screen, and it was from the 33rd degree Freemasonic, 33rd degree Supreme Council of Freemasonry in Paris. Mm -hmm. Now it revealed in its minutes its promotion of evolution as a fake science, while they themselves actually scoffed at the idea and the minutes read as following okay and this is a quote now it is with this object in view that we are constantly arousing a blind confidence in these theories the intellectuals without any logical verification will put into effect all the information available from science which our agents have cunningly pieced together for the purpose of educating their minds in the direction we want do not suppose for a minute that these are empty words. Think carefully of the successes we arranged for Darwinism. Okay. And a quote from New Age magazine in March 1922. It said, The kingdom of atheistic, atheistic Freemasonry will be established by the theory of evolution and the development of man himself. The false scientific ideology of evolution is a deception set in the 33rd degree atheistic Freemasonic lodges. Freemasons openly admit that they will use the scientists and media which are under their control to present this deception of scientific fact, which even they find funny. Yeah, they just treat us like cattle, don't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. So... Yeah, I mean, it, it, 
it's there's so much evidence, you know, that um, that that evolution as a theory is just is just bunkum. I mean, Darwin himself admitted um, towards the end of his life, and it's in and it's in uh, one of his books. I think it's the Life and Works or something along that nature. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, he, he said that you know he couldn't he could not see that how evolution was possible at all. So, you know, straight from the horse's mouth, if you like. And yet they still push it. It's incredible. Well, of course they do. Yeah, I mean, they still push it because they still want want us to believe in it. And and you have, you know, shows like Richard Dawkins, who writes books called The God Delusion and all that kind of thing, and who just basically ridicules anybody who who who, who doesn't believe in the theory. And that's a very important point, actually. It's a theory. Yeah. You know, it's not the fact of evolution. It's still called evolutionary theory for a good reason, because it's they know that it's not fact. Yeah, the same as the Big Bang Theory. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> so the only, you know the, what does this only, tell us? <laughs> yeah. So the only atheist um, academic speaker that I really liked, and I think that was more because of his wit, and that was Christopher Hitchens. Oh yes, yeah, Christopher Hitchens, yeah, and yeah. and he he loved a good argument, but yeah, I disagree on him about the not being a god aspect. I think the trouble is the word god has so many connotations now. Yes, it's it been has. hijacked. It has, yeah, and it's and it's used as a yeah, it's used by science uh, or the proponents of fake science as a kind of. Ridicule, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, and um, you know, oh, God, oh, religion. Yeah, it's just uh, superstitious nonsense. Uh, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sat here propounding about re religion other than organized religion. I mean, I, I'm, I'm it's a spiritual. spiritual, person. Yeah, spiritual. I, I believe in, I believe in God, whatever you want to call it, a creator. Uh, but I certainly don't believe in 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 uh, mainstream religion. In any way, shape, or form, I just think that has been that's used just been used as a control mechanism over the millennia. That's all that that's Absolutely. all that is about, and that's all that's for. In my view, mm -hmm. I respect that there might be people out there who, you know, may be offended by that, but it's just my view. I would never decry anybody who believes that, uh, and that is entirely up to them. But um, you know, it's just not my bag, if you like. Mm -hmm. So, and I would I would go as so far as far as to say that like the the bible especially regarding the end times i would say that was written by the cabal yeah i i, I believe so too i mean we know we know for a fact and christians may dispute it but we know that christianity was created artificially to encompass all the pagan re religions yeah. together and um you know it it, it it kind of adopted all the different elements of all the different pagan religions. That's why we get things like the, the word Yule, which was originally a pagan festival, which was adopted by Christianity. And that was to encompass all the pagan beliefs into it and to capture the audience, if you like, of all the pagan beliefs. So it became credible for all the, the non-believers, if you like, in, in their doctrines. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, it, it it was kind of created artificially for that reason. And Again, in my view, uh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to cause any uh, yeah. religious yeah. wars breaking out, yeah. out over there. Got some weird, some weird sounds going on. Um, Easter was also um, wasn't that like a, a that was a, a celebration plus. of fertility. Yes, it was originally, and it was adopted by Christianity again to encompass all the people who believed in that and and try and convert them to Christianity. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there you go. So we talked about the Freemasons. So let's dive in a little bit to the Skull and Bones and the Bilderberg and Bohemian Grove. Let's uh, let's pick your brains yeah. on that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. For those who are not aware, obviously Skull and Bones is a. Um, is a secret society um, which is based at Yale University. Um, oh, is it Harvard? Gosh, my brain's gone now. It's one of the two, anyway. Um, the two major universities in the States are Harvard and Yale. I think it's Yale University where Skull and Bones is based. And basically anyone who is anyone, all the elite families, all become members of Skull and Bones. And this is a kind of adjunct to Freemasonry, if you like, or it's a similar kind of 
uh, uh, set up to Freemasonry, um, whereby um, it's it's dressed up as a kind of a a benevolent. Well, I, I, probably Skull and Bones isn't even dressed up as being benevolent, unlike Freemasonry. But Skull and Bones, you have to be a member of Skull and Bones to be anybody in society, and all the young elite families, the, all the sorry, all the children of the elite families. Who, who were inducted into Skull and Bones and have some very nefarious practices to go through the initiation ceremonies, some of which I won't go into on air because they're just vile. Isn't one uh, masturbating in a coffin? Or well, that kind of thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's even worse than that, actually. But, um, yeah, and uh, th this kind of makes them, uh, it bonds them because, um, not you know, none of them want, would ever want to be outed uh, as to performing all this stuff, you know, and, uh, you know, and some of the stuff they get up to is, is really quite vile and it's not fit for public consumption over uh, over the air, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, this, this kind of bonds them and it, and it keeps them in control. And this, of course, is this is how everything is, is run uh, by society, by the people who, who run society today. It's about keeping control and it's about fear. And these these initiation ceremonies and the rites that they have to go through actually bind them to that club, if you like. Compr and, sorry, compromises them. Yeah, compromises them and 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 uh, you know makes them blackmailable, if you like. Like trips to Epstein Island. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, yeah skull, skull and bones. I mean, there's there's. Um, uh, all the big uh, Ivy League universities in the States have them. Uh, there's the, the Scroll and Key. Um, I can't remember that. which universities they actually apply to off the top of my head, but the Scroll and Key as well, which is kind of a lesser known type of Skull and Bones organization. Uh, Phi Beta Kappa, that's another one from one of the Ivy Leagues. And uh, yeah, they're, they're all elite clubs, if you like. And once you're in that club, you are protected for the rest of your life and you're promoted beyond your capabilities into positions of power in society and that's how it works you know so is, people... is it the skull and bones which is linked to 322 the number 322 yes yeah yes it is yeah um so how yeah. does that tie in with the bilderberg then are they all part of the same club um they're all intrinsically connected um obviously bilderbergers is, is kind of different to that because uh, Skull and Bones and Phi Beta Kappa and, and Scroll and Key, they are specific to those universities and the young people that belong to those universities that eventually find their way into society. And then, yeah, the Bilderberg Group is a big kind of umbrella organisation that that, that is, con consists of all world leaders, socialites, royalty, all the people in the top echelons of society are invited to the Bilderberg meetings. And, uh, but, you know, it, the two are not um, mutually exclusive, obviously, but neither are they, um, you know, neither does one equate exactly to the other. So, the, the, I mean, the, the elite society at the top, it's a, it's a big mishmash of lots and lots of different organisations, such as Freemasons, the, secret, the University Secret Societies, uh, the Bilderberg Group, the Committee of 300, um, the Club of Rome, That's the WEF, they're all elements of it, but, you know, they're all slightly different. And, then you know, some there is some overlap between the members, obviously. Um, yeah, so it's all a big club. And as George Carlin once famously said, we it's a big it. club and you ain't in it. No, but it's the same club that they used to beat you over the head with mm. 24 mm. hours a day. So, See, 9, 9 11 woke me up, I think, to right. the majority of this. But I watched your interview with Jeff Bice Cars. So, shout out to Jeff Bice Cars. Oh, right. Yeah. And, Good uh, old Jeff. Did you, I, I believe you said it was the Princess Diana um, yeah. assassination that woke you up. Yeah, it, it was. And again, I apologize to anyone out there who's listening. I've heard me tell this story before because, I, you know, I do get asked it quite a lot. What woke, woke you up, John? And uh, yeah, we had some friends who were in Paris that weekend when Diana was killed. It was about August Bank Holiday weekend, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. And um, 
they came back and we met them for coffee and you know, had a nice time and all that. And said, yeah, great time, but we, something really strange happened while we were there. And I said, what, you mean Diana was murdered? And they said, no, no, no not that. Um, she said, yeah. Um, it, we, we've been out for a meal, went back to the hotel, flopped down on the bed, switched on the news. It was kind of gone midnight. And... Um, so the first image we saw on TV, first moving image we saw on the TV, it was all in French, they didn't understand it, but they could see the pictures. The first image that they saw was Diana walking to the ambulance. Now, we've been told at that point, and still are, that Diana never regained consciousness after the accident. Mm -hmm. And so they found that very strange. And then, of course, what, what happens is that you... you when you become a seasoned researcher like myself, you realise that over the years, all the first news reports and images that you get of any incident are always the most accurate. And then what happens is the news organisations obviously are being told you can't show that because it doesn't fit the agenda. So they, they pull them. OK, so that piece of footage, I, I actually saw that. It actually appeared on the Internet very briefly in the early 2000s. And I actually saw it for myself eventually. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that was what kind of made me start delving into things. I'd always been, you know, curious and I didn't believe, particularly believe the media or the news. You know, I mean, uh, as soon as Diana was killed, I thought, yeah, she's been murdered. But I didn't really kind of um, think it with much conviction until I started looking into it properly. Um, you know, it's the same with lots of incidents. I, I thought, mm, yeah, I'm not not sure about that. They're lying to us. But I never really followed anything up. But it was it was Diana that kick-started my, my interest in, um, you know, what was geopolitics, if you like, what's really happening in the world. And it just went from there. And from there I started writing uh articles for websites you know and uh, they were getting published on various different truth of websites and then i started writing books creating books rather than writing articles for websites so you know that that's been my career so far and all, all so 27 years of it <laughs> you're you're a little bit i suppose on par with david ike both in length of terms that you've been dedicated to uncovering the truth and yeah you well books it, and you write books yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's a bit ahead of me, you know, obviously he's, he's far more popular than I am. Um, yeah, I met David a couple of times and we had a nice chat, but um, I don't agree with everything he says, by the way. No. Um, I think there's some very questionable stuff that he goes into, but don't tell him I said that, but... <laughs> well, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, well, yeah, yeah. Uh, I've done a couple of videos for Iconic, his, his, uh, his website, you know, and... Oh, that's uh, cool spend time down there at Derby where his headquarters are but yeah um I mean obviously I mean he was he was apart from you know apart from myself at, at, in the very beginning he was the only person that I knew that that felt the same way um I wasn't in touch with him then at all but um you know it was it was very it's a very lonely place to be when I was you, first say, you find it quite isolating very isolating yeah. I mean it was uh, I I thought I was going mad at one stage, and, and my family actually suggested that I seek psychiatric help at one point. Um, you know, and as I say, I didn't know anyone else who felt the same way as I did. So you I begin to since come around. Around. Sorry, I, I trust they've since come around. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, yeah. My, my marriage split up anyway um, subsequently, but uh, that's a, that's another story that I won't go into. But yeah, I mean, it, it, everything's gone full circle now from being in that position where I didn't know anyone who, um, you know, felt the same way as I did now my entire life. All my friends, acquaintances, family, every single one of them is on the same page as me. I don't really have anyone who doesn't look at the world in the same way that I do, which is a great place to be and it's very comforting. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, I, I agree. Um, yeah, I've I found it quite isolating because you are always deemed that nut job but, <laughs> absolutely yeah but i do think that thank thanks to cv19 the world has just gone huh definitely yeah do you know what I mean? it's just yeah 
I mean, everywhere I go now, everywhere you go now, you hear people talking about it. Don't you? You know, I, I don't think they could ever uh, do anything like COVID again. I don't. They just wouldn't. Nobody. I don't think people would stand for it. No. Some would, of course. Um, and yeah, you still you see know. these these losers in the car on their own with a mask on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's laughable, isn't it? Honestly, blind. I mean, I do feel sorry for them because the governments did do a great number on them. Yeah, and it is Go. usually of the older age bracket who have yeah. grown up believing that the establishment is there to protect you. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The government is your friend. Yeah, I propaganda, eh? Yeah. Amazing, Absolutely. isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> no, but I mean, these people—they're they're, very—you um, know—they're they're not infallible, but they're very clever. Mm. Um, you know, and and they know exactly which push buttons to push in the human psyche to to make people believe what they want them to believe you know it's it's a very very subtle well, they've admitted ongoing they've process sage, sage admitted that they were using psych, um, behavioral psychologists and the government were using behavioral psychologists yeah. well yeah, i mean yeah you saw all the use of uh, nlp neurolinguistic linguistic programming during the covid thing especially with all the different messages you know stay at home control the virus and the different colors that they used it's all psychological stuff i mean i've got a degree in psychology so i could read it like a book and it's funny how the covid colors are the same colors as the ukrainian flag it's true yeah, yeah I don't, i've not thought about that but yeah you're right yeah so it went from one yellow and blue to another yellow and blue straight away that's right yeah 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 definitely yeah. so yeah they're, they're very adept at controlling us they know they know exactly how how people people's brains work and you know how to get the results that they want it's um it's a very very subtle process but they're masters at it yeah but i am optimistic that we will well i do think that they've already lost in the grand yeah, scheme of things i think they i have agree lost. it's just I agree. collateral damage now I, I think they know it as well and because i know you know the last few years they've really stepped up the agenda they're really trying to rush it through, but that's that's kind of having the opposite effect to what's intended, I believe, because yeah, it's breaking more people up. Yeah, it is. I mean, COVID was, you know, I think they saw COVID as a massive mistake, actually, in hindsight, because um, it was intended. If you read the Rockefeller Lockstep document, I don't know if you're familiar mm, with that, yes. Chris. Yeah. yeah, but that was it was meant to go until 2025, but they curtailed it three years earlier because I think they realised that they were waking people up and they had to pull back. And you know, regroup, which is what they've done. Oh, they haven't finished with us yet by a long chalk. But you know, I you know, I, I really believe that now now this awakening process has started big time, which it has. I think it, it'll just snowball and we will win. And people are also waking up to things like the spraying of the skies. Yes. You no. Know, I mean my mum says, Oh, it's water vapor. I said, No, it's not. Say again, sorry. My mum said, Oh, it's just water vapor. I said, No, no, it's not. Yes. Some of it is. You know, yeah, when, of you, when you see a plane yeah. go in and you see the, the streets, but then they're disappearing as quickly as they were made, that's water vapor. Yeah. But when it just right. lingers and then becomes a cloud, yeah, you yeah. start off with a really nice sunny day, and then by <laughs> mid afternoon, it's just haze. It, yeah, it happens every day virtually, doesn't it? You know, you get uh, a lot of it where you are. Oh gosh, yeah. I think it's everywhere where there's, um, you know, where the civilization basically, if you can call Scarborough civilization. But there you go. Um, part of the world, Scarborough. Well, yeah, it's nice. It's a lovely place to live. Actually, it's really nice. I'm just yeah. joking. It's beautiful coastline here. Yeah. You know, the, the this Yorkshire coast, the East Coast, is uh, stunning. Yeah, see, I'm, stunning. Not, I'm, I'm not that far from Great Yarmouth and Hemsby and. Okay, and all those places. So yeah, you know, we're so lucky to have that so yeah. close. Yeah, sure. I'd probably like it a bit closer than it is, but it's still about an hour's drive. Oh, okay, but that's yeah. not too well, bad. We're a fifteen-minute walk from the beach, so <laughs> yeah. So I imagine it's quite harsh in winter, though. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's been very windy generally. The, you mm, know, the, the weather hasn't it, but, but it's been horrendous. been really bad here. I mean, the the wind has just been icy cold, blowing in off the North Sea. You know, but... no, absolutely. Um, let's let's move this on to the the moon landings. <gasps> yeah, dun, dun, dun. the moon landings, indeed. Because this fascinates me. I watched, yeah, I mean, I've watched the, the, that documentary. A funny thing happened on the way to the moon. Yeah, about Sybil, was it? Yeah, yeah, and that was on Netflix. 
I think I watched that one. Um, it, yeah, it's been it's been on various different websites, I think, and uh, yeah. Um, I mean, like, yeah, I think you, we need to start off with um, just. Bring up some notes here, actually. Yeah, yeah. When you start off with uh, NASA, I think is a good place to start. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think a lot of people, again, similarly to Diana and 9/11 and COVID, realize that the moon landings were just a complete joke. There was no way that they were real at all. Um, in fact, some people say that NASA stands for never a straight answer, and that is very <laughs> true. Um, they're constantly being caught out lying, bending the truth, contradicting themselves, fudging answers to questions that they know will incriminate them. What's the red if thing in NASA? In the NASA logo, you've got that red thing. Uh, so it's NASA, and you've got like the red. It almost is like a snake's tongue. It is, yeah. It's like a yeah. yeah it's like a V shape, isn't it? Running through That's it, right. yeah. Well, if yeah. you use that as a T, and then you mix the words up from NASA, you've got Satan. Satan. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny you should say that because, again, maybe a lot of people don't know this. You know how NASA was founded. Um, Third Reich, wasn't it? Well, kind of. I mean, one of the one of the original proponents of NASA was a guy called Werner von Braun, who was an ex-Nazi. Um, but th there were there were other people involved. There were there were five main protagonists. Okay, these weren't the people that actually officially founded it, but they were the people that mooted the idea and began it. And they were, as I say, Werner von Braun, who'd been uh, uh, shipped over to America as a result of Operation Paperclip, which is whereby all the Nazi, ex-Nazi scientists were subsumed into the American scientific community. A guy called Jack Parsons, who was a young rocket scientist, and a friend of um, the most evil man in the world, so, as it was called, Alistair Crowley. Um, uh, a guy called L. Ron Hubbard, who was founder of the pseudo-religion of Scientology. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and surprisingly enough, and most people will be uh, gobsmacked by this, I guess, uh, Walt Disney. Now, yes, what, what do all... Man. Yeah. Now, what do all those five people have in common, right? They were all masters of the occult. Jack Parsons was a black magician. He was a Satanist, and he was head of the Ordo Templi Orientis, which is part of the Satanic movement, if you like, uh, in California. I'll say Alistair Crowley. He was a 33rd degree Freemason. Again, Ordo, Ordo Templi Orientis, black magician, Satanist, L. Ron Hubbard, who was a mass mind controller, black magician, Satanist, as I said, founder of the Church of Scientology, and, and Walt Disney, who again was an occultist, a mass mind controller. He was a black magician. He was an Illuminati paedophile. He was a Freemason and found, founder of a satanic organization called the Ordem de Mole. Am I um, thinking that they... He, they, well, not him because he was already dead, but um, because they put him on ice, didn't they? Biogenics, yes, so they, so they, they created did. the film Frozen because people were typing in Disney Frozen to get images of Walt, and so they created right. the film Frozen. So every time you typed it in, that's what you'd get the film, yeah. I mean, all it's all the sexualization hidden amongst Disney, yeah, yeah. It's, you know, yeah. I, I grew up loving Disney, and yeah, me too. Especially all the Christmas Disney. things, and now I just feel so vile. It's va it, 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 well, it is vile. I mean, it is absolutely vile what goes on. For, the, for those people listening now who are not aware, but there's so many sexual images embedded. You know, subtle sex, sexual Im subtle sexual imagery embedded into Disney films. Uh, it's just it, it beggars belief, and this is subtly. Influence in our children, basically. Um, yeah. So anyway, to get to get onto the moon landing oh, thing. Yeah. Um, I think if anybody actually still believes that they actually land the men on the moon, they really need to think it all through a bit more carefully. Um, you know, how on earth did they? You know, did they pull it off? Uh, but it was quite simple, really. 
I mean, the elite, obviously, who, who planned and executed it, never let anyone see too much of the whole picture. Mm-hmm. You know, the, that technique is well known. It's called compartmentalization, and it's preval- prevalent in every element of society. So the thousands of people involved with the moon landings only had their own small part of the whole upon which they had to concentrate. For example, mission control was in Houston. The launch site was in Florida, obviously, Cape Kennedy, Cape Canaveral, whatever the hell it's called this week. Um, You know, the engineers, mechanics, computer programmers, et cetera, were all based mostly in California. So they were all isolated from each other and there was no crossover between them. So most people, would never be able to figure out the big picture and basically that it amounted to nothing more elaborate than a Hollywood production which of course it was directed by uh, Stanley Kubrick in fact and it was a very unconvincing one at that and it's fairly simple to expose once once you scratch below the surface um you know it, it, there's so many you know people suggest well why would they do it what's you know, what's the point of it but you know there are, there are several most motives that I can think of um, for the U.S. government to fake the moon landings. Um, some of the more prominent elements of that are distraction. The government actually benefited from a, a popular distraction to take uh, attention away from the carnage of the, which was very very unpopular, and that was the VM, Vietnam War. Um, and funnily enough, the the lunar missions did actually abruptly stop even though one or more and i think there were more planned future missions were in the pipeline they were all cancelled at exactly the same time that the u.s ceased its involvement in the vietnam war and of course there's other elements like cold war prestige um you know the government considered it absolutely vital for propaganda purposes that the US should win the space race. You yeah, know, people, said, people say, oh, well, why didn't Russia call it out? But yeah, if but... I'm right in thinking, that was during mm. the Cold War or just after. So w- Russia was relying heavily on the food from America. Is that correct? That is correct. It, it would and... literally be biting the hand that fed them if they were to yeah. say, no, that didn't happen. That's right. Russia was very much dependent on the grain from the North American prairies. And uh, America agreed to ship 30 million tonnes of grain to Russia. But even more than that, the Americans already knew that uh, the Russians had faked the first man in space. And again, that's very easy to prove. Um, Gagarin, uh, when he was, Yuri Gagarin, who was allegedly the first man in space, when he was interviewed afterwards, uh, he made lots of mistakes and he said he was there when he should have been there and and here when he should have been over there and and he he couldn't remember what color uniform he was wearing um and as a result of that you may remember this or not you probably not able to remember it actually happening but you may have heard of it and that was the, the fact that Yuri Gagarin died allegedly in a car crash you know literally a, a very few weeks after after his um, after his space exploits or fake space exploits, but I believe that he was murdered because he basically screwed it up. He gave so many clues that it hadn't happened, and uh, I think they just took him out. Lots, lots of the astronauts have died unexpectedly in weird circumstances. Absolutely, there was, yeah. There was the, a train crash, wasn't there as well? If I remember. I've not heard of the train crash, but I know there was lots of individual accidents. There were plane crashes, you know, private plane crashes, motorbike accidents, car accidents, lots of NASA science, uh, uh, astronauts. And, of course, the most famous ones of all were the Apollo 1 astronauts who were burnt to death, mm. you know, uh, literally the week before Apollo 1, which is obviously the beginning of the Apollo project, uh, Gus Grissom, um, Ed White and Roger Chaffee, <clears throat> burnt to death in their uh, in their capsule uh, on takeoff, and yeah, uh, it's, it's strongly believed, you know, that that was no accident because only the week before Grissom had been uh, had had a press conference and he'd hung a lemon when he's when he's asked what he what the you know what he thought of the Apollo project, he hung a lemon on a wire coat hanger and dangled it in front of the camera and said that there is no way we are going to the moon. 
before 1970. No way. And then a week later, him and his two cronies were dead. So, yeah, make of that what you will. Then, of course, I mean, there's the money element of it as well. Uh, NASA raised, yeah, NASA raised a, approximately $30 billion by pretending to go to the moon, and that's in 1969 money. So, you know, you can multiply that by at least 20 now, I would say. And, uh, you know, some of these, some of this money could have been used to pay for a large number of in-the-know people, which obviously provides a significant motivation for complicity. And I've also heard stories about people being threatened or the families being threatened if they spoke out. Lot, lots of other people other than astronauts were murdered. Um, you know. I mean, you've only got to look at the when, like, um, the astronauts for the actual moon landing and they were given press talks and stuff. Uh, they yeah. all looked scared yeah. and guilty none of them looked like hey we've just been to the moon exactly there was no it was all really yeah and anybody wouldn't you think that anybody who just undertaken such a magnificent voyage and such a magnificent achievement they'd be full of joy and you know just full of themselves basically but if anyone to what watches that video and it's still available on the uh, internet that video um the press conference of the uh, the Apollo 11 astronauts that you know, allegedly the first men on the moon, then you would never have seen a more morose, disinterested looking bunch of men in your whole life. I mean, it's just, it really does tell a story. Um, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's just mind blowing. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 some of the questions that were asked, um, they were asked about the stars, for example. And one of them said, we never even notice the stars, and you're like, we never even notice the stars. Without the Earth's atmosphere, that should have been the most magnificent vista you could possibly imagine. Yeah, you only have to kind of go out into the forest, you know, where exactly. you're away from the street lights and the from the light pollution. Lovely, yeah. yeah, and can you imagine what it would be like in outer space, looking at the stars? I mean, it would have just been absolutely magnificent. But no, they never even noticed that. Um, and if you notice, none of the photographs, none of the moon photographs show any stars no, they don't. Um, and the reason for that is of course that um, yeah absolutely or area 53 or whatever it's called yeah. 51 yeah. area 51 That's it. Yeah. but I'll tell you what else I always find quite bizarre is that when they supposedly take and not just the moon land but since where they take photos from the moon and the earth's just like a little speck Yes. Yeah, you look outside the window on a night, and the earth, the moon's quite big. Yes. Well, it's the same distance, and the earth yeah. is like 10 times the size of the moon. Yeah. So why is the earth so small, yet the moon is... <laughs> exactly. It should <laughs> fill the whole sky, shouldn't it? The, it the should, earth. really. Yeah, yeah. And then I mean, they were caught, they were caught, caught faking the, the film of the earth from the, uh, from the uh, Apollo... The window, yeah, through the window. That's it. Yeah, you've seen the bid. Um, I think that was about Sibril as well, wasn't it? Yeah. Was that was that it actually from a funny thing on the way to the moon? Yeah, 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 it was. Yeah, yeah. So much stuff. I mean, I've written a whole massive, you know, that much of a chapter on the moon landings alone, or on moon landings and NASA, and uh, something like you know, a seven hundred and thirty-four <laughs> page book. It is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's so much information, it's difficult to know where to start. You know, the Van Allen radiation belts, which again are a, a huge argument for not having reached the moon or anywhere even near it. Um, uh, uh, Van Allen himself, I forget his first name off the top of my head, um, James, James Van Allen actually said, actually didn't believe in the moon landings at all. Um, because he said it's, it's not possible. You just can't, you, you cannot penetrate them at all. Um, he, I mean, James, James Van Allen died at the age of 92 uh, in 2006, and he said it was impossible. Uh, but of course, his words were suppressed and ignored and never widely reported. And, you know, outer space, just one or two other little bits here, outer space is absolutely full, allegedly, of deadly radi radiation that emanates from solar flares from the sun. Now, this is the official mainstream explanation of it. I don't, I don't buy it 
in the sense that I don't, you know, I don't, I don't believe in the model of the universe as, as they tell us. But oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. But if if we use their explanation of it, then outer space is absolutely riddled with deadly radiation. And, you know, the little thin tin can that they went into was absolutely no protection against radiation. They would have been dead. You know, they would, even if they'd gone beyond the Van Allen belts. You know, uh, a NASA physicist actually admitted um, once that he said that shielding at least two metres thick would have been needed to protect the astronauts from the radiation generated by the Van Allen belts. Yet the walls of the lunar landers, which allegedly transported the astronauts from the spaceship to the moon, were about the thickness of heavy-duty aluminium foil. And this is NASA's own words. You know, how could something, the thickness of aluminium foil, possibly stop all that radiation? Uh, I think the thing that beggars my belief is, who was already on the moon filming it land? Oh, yeah. And who was left behind filming it take off? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, you know, the, I do a massive piece on the photographs as well. The photographs, um, some of some of the photograph stuff is used as straw man arguments to knock down the, uh, or to debunk the idea that the moon landings never took place. You know, things like the length of the shadows and all that kind of things. But there are some very, very telltale elements of the photographs. Um you know, lots of people didn't even believe it. Arthur C. Clarke said it was a hole in history. Um, the British historian AJP AJP Taylor, who was you know the most prominent historian of the time, referred to it as the biggest non-event of my lifetime. You know, so yeah, it's I mean, just... even NASA say that they haven't got the technology. They've lost the technology to go. Well, back to yeah, them. I mean, how does that happen? Exactly. I mean, you know, this is supposed to be the, the great man's greatest achievement of all time. And they've actually lost the technology. I mean, come on. They've actually lost all the all the uh, all the data reels as well. And all the uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? All the all the data, all the scientific data that they collected. Apparently, there were 700 crates of this stuff and they've lost it. And uh, oh, and, and one NASA guy came out and said, "Oh yeah, well, it wasn't actually lost. We actually overwrote those tapes accidentally because there was a there was a serious uh, magnetic tape shortage in the late nineteen seventies. What the hell is a serious magnetic tape shortage? And why would you use the record of man's greatest ever achievement, you know, and overwrite them? That doesn't make sense. No, of course it doesn't. None of it makes sense. It's all." Do you, oh. think we, do you think we've been to the the moon in any capacity? No. Like you'll, you'll get these people argue saying, well, if you've got a good um, good telescope, you can see the mirrors that they left, that they then hit the lasers on. No, that's, that's a lie. It is an absolute lie. It's been proven to be a lie. They never show you the photographs that prove that. They just tell you that, well, that's the case. It, it's, just a, it's just a lie, I'm afraid, because it's not... Uh, it's not been, uh, you know, validated in any way, shape, or form. Right. Yeah. Right. So, move, moving on from the moon landing. Yes. How about what's your take on the old climate, and how would you say that ties into Agenda Twenty One or Twenty Thirty? In the what? Uh, the, the the climate change stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well. Um, okay, let me just get my notes up here. I think it's uh, yeah. yeah, I mean obviously climate change. I mean to be fair, yeah, climate change is happening. There's no doubt about it. But it's not man-made. This is the point, but and they ridiculously, and for their own particular agenda, um conflate the two. So, you know, they conflate the, the climate change idea with man-made climate change. And, you know, the two are totally not compatible. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, they, they blame this 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 terrible... Um, Gas of life. Yeah, the CO2. And, uh, you know, the, the CO2 has been demonised 
But really, what glo global warming is all about, it's it's just a scam to justify the transformation of, of society. And as, as you say, that links into Agenda 2030 because, you know, they're using, or they, uh, and they will continue to do, and that will grow, I'm absolutely convinced of that, to use the excuse of climate change in order to exert more power and control over us. Um, and who's behind it? Long. Yeah. Who's behind it? It's the usual suspect. It's the IPCC, which stands for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a political, not a scientific body. Um, the Royal Society, the National Geographic, Wikipedia, the Met Office, the WEF, the WHO, the United Nations, and of course, these are all tools of the New World Order. So, you know, it's absolutely proven not to exist. It's simply part of an ongoing fluctuation in temps, temperatures, which has been going on since time began, whenever that was. Climate changes, and it's changing at the moment. But the, the, the uh, caveat to that is that climate is not getting hotter, like they tell us. They're desperate to try and prove that it is, but it's actually getting cooler because we're entering something called a grand solar minimum. And that will last for about 40 years, allegedly, according to real scientists and real meteorologists. And, uh, you know, the temperatures are going to get cooler. You know, as simple as that. Um, OK, I knew we were coming out of an ice age. Yeah, and that's why the graph only goes back so far because if it went back further, you would see that it's been much yeah. hotter with much higher carbon levels. Yeah, but I didn't know. We Absolutely. Were going into that, the mini. What did you call it? The grand solar minimum, and it's just a part of a, an ongoing cycle. You get minima, solar minima, and so solar maxima, and it's just an ongoing cycle. Yeah, fluctuations in temperature and climate. And we're, we're entering a minimum. And it's to do with the, again, this is a mainstream thing, but I'm just quoting their own stuff back at them. They, um, you know, the, the, the sun goes through various phases, apparently, in its life cycle. And, you know, one of the, one of the phases is a minimum amount of activity, and the other one is a maximum amount of activity. In a maximum, the temperature gets hotter. In a minimum, it gets cooler logic yeah oh uh, yeah sense. see bill oddy knew this didn't he bill oddy was a uh, the late bill oddy oddy yeah. and uh so they quickly brought in what's the david attenborough yeah and yeah lost a lot bill oddy yeah yeah bill oddy the the yeah i know he is i didn't realize he died though oh yeah he died for a while ago yeah oh, did but, okay but he he was he was dead yeah, against, interesting like, calling it do hickey but no yeah. no well listen yeah. i've really enjoyed our conversation and, and of course they tell us that 99 percent of scientists yeah. yeah go on sorry now we're going to say they tell us that 99 percent of um uh scientists are uh, actually believe in climate change and believe it to be real but most objective surveys have concluded that so scientists who actually believe in man-made, and that's the important word there, man-made climate change, are in a small minority. Yeah, um, that. You know, And we're now entering this 30, 40 year minimum. Uh, so. It's an incredible <laughs> um, world we live in. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could say that. But it's I am looking different. forward to the solutions, and I am looking forward to seeing the world right itself from these people. Yeah, absolutely. But thank you so much for your time. I yeah. really enjoyed hearing what you had to say. Can you, you tell me the links to your books? Then I'll put them in the video description. Yeah. Um, my uh, my Amazon page, if you go to amazon.co.uk or wherever anyone is in the world, um, and just type in my name in the search bar and it will bring all my books up. Um, I'm just adapting my website at the moment to be able to, or oh, having it adapted for me, for it to be able to um, accept okay. online orders for my own personal signed books, uh, but that's not quite ready yet. It'll certainly be done in the next few weeks, I guess. 
but it's not quite ready yet. But my website is falsificationofhistory.co.uk. Uh, and I have a BitTube channel, which is called John Hamer Official. Um, I will add all those into the uh, video description. There's some weird feedback on this. It makes it sound like there's a demon in me here. But no, brilliant. Thank you so much for your time and your knowledge. And all the links will go in the description. No problem, Chris. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you. You too. And, uh, you know, whenever you want me back on again, just let me know. And I'll be glad to talk about any other subject you get to name. No, absolutely. That would be amazing. And I'd appreciate that. I've now got an interview with um, Gary Waterman. Okay. So that should be quite an interesting one. Yeah. Well. So, All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Brilliant. You're welcome, mate. And All I hope the best to you. watching has enjoyed it as much as I have. But for now, yeah. take care. Me, and me too. Speak to you soon. Bye. Yeah. All the best. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>